writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Uh, welcome to Right Pack Radio. Uh, I'm your guest host today, uh, Brad R. Cook. Um, I have that glorious duty because our uh, great leader, David Lucas, is uh, otherwise detained at the moment. He's writing. Uh, exactly. Yeah, he's on a writing retreat. Check that episode out. <laughs> exactly. Good, thanks. All right, so that means hosting duties get dumped on me today. <laughs> Uh, I am earned the author. Earned by you. I like earned. that. Okay. Yeah, let's use our positive phrase. Positive yes. voice, fine. <laughs> okay, now, I am an author of steampunk novels. Uh, Iron Horseman is out now, and Iron Zulu is coming out this fall. Uh, so do check those out. You can find everything at bradrcook.com. I pass it over, as always, to our co-host. Hello, I'm Kathleen Kayembe. I write paranormal romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, and I'm not being replaced by anyone today, nope. so you're stuck with me. That we I'm know sorry, of. everyone. Are you a pod person? If I were, would I tell you? No. Oh, we'll just dang. have to live in... All right, well, there with that first question. She's not a pod person. Mm. Well, my name is Jennifer Stolzer, and I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I write fantasy and uh, illustrate books for other people. If you want to check out Dog Park, it's my own, available on Amazon. And at STL Books, which is now being featured in the front window today. Ooh, so that's nice. pretty exciting. I waved at it. <laughs> hmm. Oh, am I up next? Go. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Matt McGraw. Uh, I'm an amateur short story writer. Uh, I'm also I'm uh, sending out a picture book called Patrick the Spider, uh, which will hopefully ride some waves of popularity. Well, at least get picked up. <laughs> Just give me money, please. <laughs> Fedora Amos. I write Victorian Whodunits, and I'm president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime. If you want to put a little romance in your fiction, come to see us on the third Wednesday in April at the Samuel Sachs Branch, 7 to 9, to hear Claudia Shelton, who does romantic suspense, and she really can put some... <clears throat> Heat under your story. <laughs> nice. Can I just say that you use both suspense and the the you know <clears throat> for heat? She wiggled her eyebrows at us before she told us where. <laughs> it was really I cool. can't help it. <laughs> ah, I love it. Well, that's who's here today. Uh, today we are here to talk about the writing rules according to dun 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 dun. Uh, today we're actually going to focus on several, uh, including Elmore Leonard. Starting with and primarily Elmore Leonard. Exactly. Because Elmore I love Leonard. Elmore Leonard. And yes. I quote him whenever I possibly can. Mm, I like that. So Elmore Leonard, for those who don't know, famously wrote down the 10 rules for writing. Um, I highly recommend you check them out. And we're about to talk to them. I think Matt's got them. Oh, yes. Uh, I have a, a printout of them here. So let's uh, start. What are the 10 rules so we can start just, on a base? Just all 10 or just the first one or what? I guess I start with all 10 so all they can know, and then okay. we'll just run back okay. and can define them. Because not everyone's heard these. I had not heard yes. them. And we have a penchant for tangenting. Mm -hmm. That is true. Mm -hmm. so that is true. Let's, let's, let's get them out of the, the way tan right one now. is the most important one, though. Yes. <laughs> so. Which is why, I, that's what I say. Let's roll them out, and then we'll talk about them. Uh -huh. All right. So, here are the ten rules with no further ado. One, never open a book with weather. Two, avoid prologues. Three, never use a verb other than said to carry dialogue. Four, never use an adverb to modify the verb said. Five, keep your exclamation points under control. Six, never use the words suddenly or all hell broke loose. 7. Use regional dialect, patois, sparingly. Avoid oh, 8. Avoid detailed descriptions of characters. 9. Don't go into great detail describing places and things. I guess don't go into great detail in general. Uh, 10. Try to leave out the part that readers tend to skip. And this is the most important rule, apparently. Yes. That is the most important rule. Uh, well, there's, oh, oh, yeah, there's yeah. one. Summary. There yeah. is an eleventh rule. There is. This is a. This is a. 
mystery plot here. Uh, the most important rule is the one that sums up the ten. If it sounds like writing, I rewrite it. Good rules. Hmm. All right, and I will tell you that you can find those everywhere, including actually elmoreleonard.com, <laughs> uh, where you can find a great meme of them and just slap that up on your wall. <laughs> uh, all right, so now we get to go in-depth into these ten rules. Let's start with number one. It was a dark and stormy night. Put it down. <laughs> yep. I can't open a book that opens that way. Nope. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Bowler Litton Prize for the worst prose, the worst prose openings. And it's, of course, named after Bowler Litton because that's exactly how he opened every one of his <laughs> stories. It was a dark and stormy night. Which worked at a certain point in our history. <laughs> no, huh? uh, that that time is gone. And yeah. now find a much, much more creative way, please. <laughs> but you know, it, it's like hearkening back to even farther past because the in the in older times, in much earlier times, the Greeks, the Greek playwrights, and the uh, those who followed them in Rome said you should start a play or any kind of fictional writing, which for them would have been poems mostly, in the middle of things, in Medius Race. Which we still, you know, kind of aspire to today, where we say start as close to the action as possible. Yes. There's an inclination to do the weather just because it's, uh, it's an establishing kind of thing. If you imagine that it's like your book is like a movie and you're seeing yep. it in your head. You know, you're like, oh, I need my establishing yep. shot, so I'll come down from the rain. And then we'll pan in, or we'll uh, move into the uh, house, and then there will be people. Yes. Lucas did it beautifully with the whole, like, giant ship and, mm -hmm. you know, in the beginning of Star Wars. But that was starting out with, like, information. Uh, what he note, what uh, Elmore notes here is that the reader is apt to leaf ahead looking for people. Yeah. Okay. So, a good point. That is a good point. He does reference Barry Lo uh, Lopez in yes. that. What does he say about Barry Lopez? Uh, who has more ways to describe ice and snow than an Eskimo. <laughs> <laughs> and he gives Barry Lopez a pass on that. Because Barry Lopez is so uh, he's, he's so spiritual, but the reason I wanted you to mention his name is because he has something that I think is just wonderful too, and might be even its own rule. He says everything is held together with stories. That is all that is holding us together: stories and compassion. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't you like that? Well, the yeah, stories, nice. the yeah. stories we tell ourselves, or how we inform our lives and how we direct them. Sorry, I saw the animated feature Home the other, the other okay. week. It was really good, and it boiled down to two things. Family and the stories we tell ourselves about who we are and who other people are. Those are the main points, and it was amazing. So, um, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Tangent. You're welcome. And it's what links us to everyone, not only these days, but from other days, earlier days. Sure. And if there are creatures on other planets, I bet they have their own stories that hold them together, too. Unless they're like bug people, then they might not. No, and then... Even then bug people. <laughs> you still gotta you hear not... about the, the queen. <laughs> Did you not read Ender's Game? Even the bug people have souls. Oh, yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. I think that the the search for humanity and compassion and story is a good reason why this is rule number one. Don't open with weather. Weather is... <laughs> Compassionless and storyless and fluffy <laughs> and pointless. And unless, uh, uh, who was the, the guest for the Writers Guild who said, uh, don't tell me about the weather unless it's unusual? I think it was Susan Ledbetter. But don't yeah, I think so, that. too. Might have been Susan Ledbetter, I think. Uh, but uh, she made the point in a lecture to the Writers Guild that if the sky is blue and the grass is green, we know. Yes. Mm. But if the sky turns orange, tell us. Because that's interesting. And it might have something to do with something. There was a term that I learned in high school studying Julius Caesar that I can't remember. So if any of you guys remember it, please tell me. It's where the weather reflects the incidents going on in the story. So when Caesar is about to be killed and all this upheaval is going on in the state, the weather oh, turns awful and like stormy and ominous. Yeah, it's a, it's a storytelling technique that's been used yes. for ages and ages. But yeah, mm -hmm. I do not remember the name of it. Oh. And my phone's currently being used for counting time, or I'd look it up. <laughs> um, but no, no, you're right, because you can. You can totally take... But that's that's almost a setting or a theme to your novel. A mm -hmm. theme, almost, the weather. That's not a way uh, to start out. It enriches. Yeah. Yes, it, it's too enrich, I think, and not too... Uh, 
uh, a substitute for the actual story. Exactly. If Frankenstein's castle was a beautiful sunny day, it'd be kind of a boring story. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that dramatic thunder and lightning that produces the mm, for the story. Um, and re- with relation to Rule 10, try and leave out the part that readers tend to skip. I think one of the reasons opening with the weather now doesn't work so much is because readers are used to a faster-paced story. I was thinking about the Three Musketeers and um, older stories where there's a lot of description. Even reading Lord of the Rings, like there's a lot of description of the, the landscape mm-hmm. and the peoples and... There is not as much, I guess, overt character development going on. It's a very nature... There were 150 pages about trees. (laughs) That. And today's readers are more likely to want to skip to the action, to what is this character doing that I'm following. Which is exactly what I did when I was reading Lord of the Rings. (laughs) (laughs) Kicks and points. Yes. Blasphemous. Um, well, the trees are still there, whether, whether or not I read about the type of bark they have. Unless they're talking, which sometimes they do <laughs> in Lord of the Rings. I don't care. Just tell me if they're scary or not. They are pretty scary. <laughs> A book like Moby Dick, for example, has tons and tons of stuff about whaling, which I found interesting because I love history. And I think people of that time would have found interesting, too, because they didn't know anything about whaling. But now, if you want to know about whaling, you've got the Internet. You can find out bunches about it <laughs> in just a few minutes. Get a YouTube video. Well, you can tell me about whaling and the new, updated, why, you know, young adult version of Moby Dick. But you're going to tell me about whaling in a brief, inconcise paragraph as opposed to three chapters of whaling, and then at one point we chase a whale. That's what the difference is between um, something like, I always go back to Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo is a fabulous writer, but if you pick up one of his books nowadays, you're overwhelmed by the scene establishment. And the reason for that is because the people reading his books probably don't get the chance to go to Paris. Exactly. And this was their opportunity to see Paris in all of its details so they feel like they've been there. Traveling is harder. Uh, Pictures aren't a thing. Movies most definitely aren't a thing. This book is the only way they're going to see Paris. So he does his best to show them all of Paris in as fine a detail as he possibly can. I don't need that help right now. I can look up a picture of Paris... I'm in it for the story, not for that experience. So it's a different motivation for reading as well as a different motivation for writing to compare something that's so heavily Tolkien-esque with all of his trees. When were these rules written? The rules were written... July 16th, uh, 2001? That was not when they were written, was it? That's when this says it was published. All I have is the sheet. The book was published then, maybe... We have the book here too. Let's see what this it book. is full of illustrations because the rules are not terribly page. long. <laughs> you have noticed. It must uh, be terrible. Right. They don't His need last to... rule on here, he says he came out in 1983. Okay. It's, it's been a while. So we'll say the rules are from the early 80s at latest. Yeah, the book is published yeah. 2001. All right. Oh, now that I look at it, you can see the cocaine. Here on you here. go. <laughs> <laughs> Originally published in the New York Times, July sixteenth, two thousand one, as "Easy on the Adverbs!" exclamation points and especially "Hoop to Doodle." Okay. <laughs> really? Yep. Of course, I think he probably had them before. I'm sure then. he he'd yeah. been yeah, speaking he wrote, on them in yeah. many, many occasions many for decades. It wasn't just hanging on to him. It was like this is my secret weapon. It's like he finally published it to New York <laughs> Times in 2001. Well, should we jump to number two now? Well, before, number two. before we do oh, that, okay. maybe we ought to say a little bit more about Elmore Leonard so that people actually get an idea of, of who he is. All right. Well, there are actually of several of his books right <laughs> yes. here in the other room. Well, what are some of the titles? Uh, you know, I probably should have grabbed all of those. <laughs> he actually has a ton of them, so I'm not even going to try and go through some of the titles because really... there are 40 plus or is more I'm reading four titles that I have from the article that I'm looking at Go on for it. the rules. Glitz, yep. Get Shorty, yep. mm-hmm. Maximum Bob, and Rum Punch. The other thing that says... Those are four of his great like, mystery mm-hmm. thrillers. And turned into movies. Yep. Even turned more in. than that. Yeah, yeah so there I'm are a ton. The man is one of the biggest, most prolific crime writers of the last century. 
Uh, and, you know. Yeah. Screenwriters, too. Because yeah. 310 to Yuma was one of his. Mm. And what? that was a movie yeah, yeah, yeah. in 57. Really? Yeah, I yeah, love yeah. that Long movie. Time. It broke Long my time. heart so wonderfully. Here's the thing. Anything that you loved and broke your heart and just crushed you as a person, <laughs> probably written by Elmore Leonard. <laughs> <laughs> Not even kidding. 310 to Yuma. I, I have that movie. Because I, you like to, to give me pain. <laughs> After you tell me that it has broken your it's heart so much. It's a bro story. <laughs> it's a bromance. It is. That was never I do work. like a good bromance. <laughs> but yeah, it, 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 and Elmore, he wrote literally, you know, just tons and tons of, and different things too. So mostly it's crime, mostly it's thriller, mostly it's, you know. So but, we started uh, out We just westerns. mentioned westerns. And yes, we, you we know, started out with westerns. And uh, he hit several other odd genres, mm. writing movies and books and other things like that. So Can do. I? He, um, Can I ask you a question, actually, oh, yeah. about him? Sure. This says, this says uh, on writingclasses.com, unlike most genre writers, Leonard is taken seriously by the literary crowd. Why Ouch. is that? <laughs> <laughs> no. It's his writing. It is, because I, I, my personal opinion on that is that his characters, like uh, Chili Palmer is a famous one from Get Shorty, mm-hmm. that they are complex i mean they seem like either really bad guys or really good guys but then they turn around and do something that's just the opposite of that Mm. so they're very complex they're not one note at all even a lot of minor characters are not one note at all so i think that makes him intriguing and it's one of the reasons why his screenplays probably are not not very difficult (laughs) because his stories are so lame to begin with and he has such flashy dialogue such wonderful dialogue so those are my Reasons why I think the critics like him. Yeah, there's a reason why Hollywood loves him so much. Why not only have so many of his books been turned into movies or become the premise of a movie, but his you know his own screenwriting has turned into gold because exactly everything you just mentioned. I would. Uh, I have a little bit here about how he actually writes, which I found interesting. Yeah, go for it. It's he writes every day of the week. That's when he was alive, of course. He's yes. probably not very much now. Well, I'm sure he's writing now. Uh, he might be. <laughs> Writing every day of the week in longhand, adding rather than cutting copy as he edits. I found that interesting. Mm -hmm. And never takes more than six months to finish. When he begins a book, he has no idea how it will end. Instead, he says, I learn where the plot is going at the same time as my lead character. So he's a pantser. Hmm. Interesting. Pantser bride. Yeah, Yeah, as opposed to a plotter. Very interesting. I'm intrigued about how far that goes, though, because... I am a hybrid, and at some point you have to know where things are going. Like, things fall into place enough that you're like, yeah, yeah. (laughs) When the the character figured it out. There we go. Um, But yeah, that's kind of interesting. All right. uh, Yeah, number two. Number two, avoid prologues. Uh Uh, Does anybody even try to do prologues anymore? Yes, lots of people do, and they're all on (laughs) (laughs) fanfiction.net. No, uh, prologue is... Yes, we uh, should say why. It, prologues are usually uh, poo-pooed by the writing community, mostly because the same reason why we don't open with weather. It distances your audience from the like actual subject of your book. So if you open a prologue talking about the character's father and how the character's father made it to America, we've become attached to the character's father, and then immediately we drop him and pick up a brand new character that we have to start from scratch on. And that could be effective... Uh, it has been used effectively in many uh, modern books that are coming out. I'm sure there's a book that's probably coming out this week that has a prologue in it somewhere. But well, they in should general, be at the beginning if they're going to be well, prologue. it's somewhere the book is coming out. <laughs> but the uh, the general rule is don't open with a prologue because it's usually an excuse for lazy world building. Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's if it's that important, then don't turn it. Don't make it a prologue. Make it your first chapter and make it count. And more than likely, where it belongs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more than likely, the, you can take the information from a prologue and fit it in later in the story, as a conversation or a, you know, not necessarily a flashback. Because please not, don't. Yeah, no back flashbacks. Backstory. That's what Elmer yeah, wanted. Exactly. Anyways, backstory. put it in his backstory. It becomes character conversation later on. So is that part of a prologue? Is what is backstory? As you guys have just called it. So it's not starting in media race. Then it's not starting in the middle of things. Is that why we're leaving it out? Uh, it's because you can take the information from it and put it into the body of the book where the character is going to realize it and express it in a more natural way. And then that becomes a way for the reader to more naturally get that information. So instead of doing a giant info dump for a couple of pages in the beginning of your book that a lot of people are going to skip past anyway and go to chapter one, 
put it in the book. So the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have two examples I would like to bring up then. Go for um, it. Lord of the Rings first. In the books, they don't use a prologue, but they have appendices full of all the things. Yes. So many appendices. And in the films, they begin them in a different way than the books begin. They begin with a prologue about the history of the ring, so you know yeah. why you care about this object being lost. And when you first see it in the film, which it then begins where the books were, you're like, oh, holy crap, everything's going to go to hell in a handbasket. And yeah. that's really important. All hell the broke loose. Oh, no. <laughs> don't, break loose. don't do that either, right? Literally, there was a volcano. Just let it break. But I think movies can get away with that better than books can. The because movie a had movie, two and a half hours to get the exact bingo. same information out. <laughs> that a book, you can spend as much time as you want in a book talking about. But in a movie, you've got to impart the beginning of the story really quickly so we can flow into the movie, which is why Dune and so many of these other things have all started off with. You know, also, like the freaky narr- narrator person. Pick your poison. Would you prefer to have all that information up front where it's useful before we get involved, or would you prefer to have it screech to a halt halfway through and have someone sit down on a couch and explain it to well, you? Well, that could just be backstory that's <laughs> not well done, not well integrated. The point is know. that when they were looking at adapting the book to the movie, they said these things are necessary for someone who hasn't read The Hobbit to know what's going on about this thing. So they laid it down in as few lines of dialogue and as much visual tone-making element as they possibly could, and I think it was a good decision. They you know, they continued to deliver backstory throughout the movie, um, but it's a movie, you know. In a book, it's they a can take medium. for as long as they want to to layer things in and make decisions and sit down and talk about things. No, don't do it too much, please. <laughs> well, I think Elmore Leonard re- objects to prologues because it's the very thing that takes the reader out of the story, even before it begins in this case, yep. and uses just the writer. The writer is right there, and he thinks that, and says often, that the writer should be invisible for historical writers of which I am one, Mm -hmm. it's often necessary to give explanations about what you've made into fiction and the things that are true. You have to make an actual explanation of what you've done in order to satisfy people who read historical fiction. But where should that be? In my estimation, it should always be at the end. Now, I realize that there are people who are going to read it first, but that's their option. They can do it. It's there. (laughs) But if you put it up front, that suggests that they're supposed to read it first. And that is something that Anybody can get rid of, I think. I was going to bring up Rule 10 again, parts readers tend to skip. I have known readers who will not read prologues. Just they won't. It'll be right there in the book, and they're like, nope, if it's not in the book, I'm not reading it. I tend to skip them. And I'll actually skip it, read on, and if some reason later on I end up loving the book, because this happens in a lot of, uh, like, TSR fantasy novels. They'll have some weird, freaky thing, the Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, TSR is the publisher of all the Dungeons and Dragons okay. novels. Uh, if you were a kid in the 80s or 90s, you read hundreds of them. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of them came with prologues. <laughs> and I would actually skip them mostly, unless for some reason I was reading on and, you know, fell in love with the book so much that I wanted more. Mm-hmm. And then I'd read that prologue and be like, oh, I didn't really need to know that anyway. Because I find often I don't need them. So that's right. why I tend to skip them. There's a book series called The Alleluia Files by Sharon Shin. She's a local author, and she's amazing. Um, But the books are fantasy. At least, I've read the first one. I know the rest of the series is awesome, but I've not read it. And I'm not sure if this plays in. She had a prologue to the first book, this fantasy book about uh, angels and romance and a lower technology world. And the prologue talks about how these people came to this planet. They're actually refugees from a different planet. It's very um, they came Anne on a, McCaffrey Yeah, style. they came on a spaceship. And the ceremony that they are performing in the, in the novel, in the body of the novel, is not a magic ceremony. It's literally to contact the ship that they don't remember is there anymore and make it not kill them all. Mm-hmm. Because the ship has specific instructions. It's not going to let this colony go bad. And the prologue will tell you that there is a ship up there and that the signaling that is going on in this ceremony is to signal that ship. And you will understand that this is sci-fi, not fantasy. 
But the book doesn't talk about the ship any, any more beyond that. They think it's the gods. What about those situations? Because, yes. I didn't read that prologue when I read that book. And I didn't care. <laughs> that I, really matter, though. I enjoyed the story for what the story was worth. And if she really thought, you know, she obviously thought that that was important. She wanted to include that. Uh, maybe make a book about that, which she did later. And then there you go. Then you're not having the, the genre completely flipped on you. You know ahead of time from that prologue that what you're going to see later. Well, Anne McCaffrey does not open uh, her dragon books with oh, by the way, this is a sci-fi. Instead, the characters discover it's a sci-fi, and it's an interesting story. That We've got all these, uh, these dragon-herding medieval weirdos wandering through their magic <laughs> land that isn't magic but has dragons and stuff in it, and they wander across a sentient computer and become best friends with it. Oh so my gosh! That, it, yeah, it, it did kind of throw the genre sideways, but the evidence was there. Like, there's also books entirely on, like, the first generation that lived on this colony, and we get to see it fall away. Hmm. But the story in each book is a story for itself. Or in the case of, like, the first three, it was a trilogy where the story arced over all three of them. Uh, Include it if you want to. Pitch it to an agent with a prologue in it if you dare. (laughs) They may like that. You know, New Leaf has published books with prologues in it all the time, even though they tell people not to put them in there. It's because they read the book and the book proved it worthy. The book, the, the book and the story that was being told in the book said this prologue is not only essential and vital, but it's essential and vital as a prologue. And then the reader went, yeah, okay, because we really just want to be told a good story. Well, and that's what all of these rules are for. These rules are to better tell a story, not necessarily to stifle and, and yell at people. It's also, you know, a prologue in particular is kind of genre-specific, I guess would be a good way of putting it. Mm-hmm. Um, in the sense that, as you were mentioning, there are a lot of fantasy novels out there, sci-fi novels that have prologues and kind of need them. Um, however, your average like thriller novel about a spy running around shooting people probably doesn't. And probably is going to be more harmed by a prologue telling you about the guy you know training at the CIA or something than it would be helpful. So in a lot of senses, if you're writing a fantasy and you have a prologue, it's probably going to be okay. If you're writing a romance novel and you have a prologue, I don't think it needs to be there. And you can probably take that and integrate it in there. Uh, You know, we've we've mentioned several different areas where prologues can be used, but at the same time there are also a lot of genres that it may not be the best in. Elmer Leonard gives Steinbeck a pass in Sweet Thursday. Uh, can mm. you read what, what he says and why he gives him a pass oh, to uh, write a prologue, even though he hates prologues? Mm-hmm. There is a prologue in there. Well, I'm, I'm quoting from him for now on. Uh, there was There is a prologue in there, but it's okay because a character in the book makes the point of what my rules are all about. He says, I like a lot of talk in a book, and I don't like to have nobody tell me what the guy that's talking looks like. I want to figure out what he looks like from the way he talks. <laughs> figure out what the guy is thinking from what he says. I like some description, but not too much of that. Sometimes I want a book to break loose with a bunch of hoop to doodle <laughs> Spin up some pretty words, maybe, or sing a little song with language. That's nice. But I wish it was set aside so I don't have to read it. <laughs> I don't want hoop to doodle get, to get mixed up with the story. And that, that I works. think, is the point. Don't get the hoop doodle mixed up with the story. Watch your hoop doodle <laughs> Got a new word now. All right. It's not purple prose. Yeah, go to three. Number three. Uh, and I'm going to read the little paragraph with this because uh, it kind of explains what he means. Never use a verb other than said to carry dialogue. And the point he makes about it is the line of dialogue belongs to the character. The verb is the writer sticking his nose in. But said is far less intrusive than grumbled, gasped, cautioned, lied. I once noticed Mary McCarthy ending a line of dialogue with she asseverated. Asseverated. No, asseverated. Asseverated. There you go. I and had to is. stop reading to get the dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to look up the pronunciation. <laughs> Mary, Mary McCarty wrote a, a book in the 60s called The Group, and it's the inspiration for Sex in the City. So it was an okay. expose of, ah. of sex in the 1930s. Okay, and it made a big, shocking kind of splash. But the reason why she used big words was that she was well-educated. And in the group, there's a difference here that I want to ask you about. 
that the group were eight girls from Vassar, who were, of course, well-educated. Mm -hmm. I see a difference, though, in having the writers say uh, so-and-so asseverated, or having one of those characters say it in dialogue. Mm -hmm. I would see a difference there. What is, what is your take on that? I would agree with that, because it's not the uh, narration's job to, uh, to be noticeable. To asseverate, by the way, is to yeah. assert Thank forcefully. You. Yes. I didn't know what that meant. You've just saved a bunch of people from looking it up. <laughs> Could you probably already did. Asserted? <laughs> It, it, that would be that would be easier, but is it better than said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, I think to your point, um, you know, and to Elmore's point actually as well is, if you use the big word instead of said, and no matter which big word it is, then you're proving your vocabulary yes. uh, as the writer. As if you're using it in dialogue, you know, if a character says something, then that is showing the character's education. And I think that is, you know, kind of a big thing. Also, uh, we tend to read over them. Uh, you know, it's going back to things people don't, you know, skipping the parts that people don't read. Um, most people run through dialogue really quickly because they hear it in their head and they hear the characters and stuff like that. So most people will just blow over a lot of dialogue tags, uh, which is why, you, you know, some writers will claim they're unnecessary. Uh, I think the main time I find them useful as a reader is if, like, a... Uh... I'm reading like a long exchange of dialogue yes. and I lose track of which line is who. And so then sometimes, you know, like a he said or a she said is useful. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's like, but that's just more of like a technical thing. You know, it's like, it's a long dialogue. Some people might lose their, which one it is. So I'll remind them which person is saying this. Yes. So they know where they're at. But if you've got two people in a room and they're the only two people talking, they should have different voices enough that I'm able to spot both of them. And that's mm. a very important point that, that Leonard makes. It's that each character should have a voice mm -hmm. that is distinct, that is identifiable, so you should rarely need any tags at all. Exactly. Anyone I don't else? Know. Well, I don't I was going to, to voice out for uh, certain in, inoffensive dialogue tags mm -hmm. that aren't said. Okay. Uh, I think if you use nothing but said, you begin to start like a journalistic, you know, article. Everything sounds very... Uh, Samey? Yes. Uh, formatted. And I think there's room to experiment as long as you don't, you know, exacerbate and things like that. Um, she exacerbated. Yeah. Yes. That's not even it's not possible with dialogue. <laughs> Sorry. You're exacerbating the problem, guys. <laughs> yes. Why are you doing this? <laughs> She asked. She asked. Stuff like she asked, asked, said, she replied. <laughs> um, thing, you know, things of that nature. I'm, I'm okay with using stuff. You know, grumbled, if you must. <laughs> see, I like the ones that <laughs> you show all needed action to see the look of disgust as well. Face. And I will use ones that show action as well, like grumbled. Because grumbled is very specific. Specific. They're, they're doing a, a non vocal action that I can include into a dialogue tag and you know that they're upset and from the context I'm sure you, I, you don't need the grumbled part but that shows you that the person you know and sometimes a character needs to but how do you dialogue you know you can't so you just say they grumbled you can't do it intelligently really I mean you can put like mm, 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 yeah, mm. yeah it's just <laughs> but then they're like exactly what the hell is this? <laughs> Did he like, fall asleep on the cat? Yeah, grumbled. It's, it's like easier. when you're reading uh, comic books or whatever, and the character just says four exclamation part points. I'm like, how did he say that? <laughs> what was that like? A, ah! <laughs> Doesn't that disobey oh. a later rule? <laughs> Probably. What? A later Maybe. exclamation oh, point. It's coming. Up. Oh yeah. Uh, I think other dialogue tags are useful. I think, as you guys have said, it should illuminate character, not the writer, um, because the writer <clears throat> in all of this is trying to tell a story and disappear. Like, the greatest trick for a writer is not being seen while you're weaving a story. So um, true. But things like a character whispering, I think those are helpful. Like Whispering's a good one. Especially in a situation where if it was just regular said, you'd be like, what the heck is wrong with you? You're going to get caught. Like, things like that. Yeah. 
whispering is good. And that way, when the word said pops out again, you're like, oh my gosh, this person's an idiot. I'm going to kill them. They're mm. talking too loud. At Romance Writers, they don't much like Sid either. <laughs> what they like are to have uh, some kind of action that would show what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that showing of what's going on, the show no tell stuff, mm -hmm. is what will tell you what kind of tone of voice the person had or whether they're whispering or whatever. See, I also like that. Getting rid of dialogue tags entirely and adding on an action to my dialogue. Mm -hmm. Because then, you know, I don't need to say so-and-so said. You see so-and-so pick up something off the table as they say something. So, the, for example, uh, something at, like, uh, the mayor rustled through papers on his desk. So, did, have you found it yet? Exactly. It's like, we don't need him to say it, because since it's part of the same paragraph... Yeah, you don't need the mayor said, said as he, he you know... Ruffling. The so. mayor said as he shuffled papers, no. Yeah. 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 And actions like that can also help... Um, convey how the character said something. Like if it's an ambiguous sort of thing, how fast he's rifling through these papers or yeah. what he's doing at the time will tell you how intensely he feels about the, su the subject. Like, have you found it yet? Like, if he's sweating bullets, he's really, really nervous about this. Mm -hmm. But if he's just like, oh, whatever, have you found it yet? Rifling through things, getting out something to drink, just yeah. leaning back in his chair, he's got a completely different mood about this same question. And you've conveyed that mood through a picture that you've painted with words versus he said nonchalantly. And you've told us about the mayor's personality, too. So, dialogue tags. What? Check. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> Check. Num uh, number four. Uh, related to that, never use an adverb to modify the verb said, so um, no, no, he said nothing defiantly. Allowed. He admonished gravely. Exactly. That's what yeah. it says on here. Don't He's use adverbs at all. part of the thing. <laughs> yes. Why she can't said you sweetly. Use she... adverbs? Well, there's. Can if you, you believe Stephen King, you should take an axe to all adverbs in your novel. Yeah. Well, what he, he and Elmore are kind of agreeing here. What he says here is uh, sort of a carry on from number three. Uh, the writer is now exposing himself in earnest, using a word that distracts and can interrupt the rhythm of the exchange. Yeah. So it's kind of a, it's just a continuation of the idea of you should, you the writer should stay out of it and you should kind of leave it as though the characters are just there and they're just whatever the reader makes of them. You should show them talking sweetly. Right. Show, don't mm -hmm. tell. Exactly. Show them being defiant. Show them instead of putting the L-Y on the end of those words. How... Um, how does this kind of writing, where you're supposed to show the characters doing everything, um, relate to things that we kind of expect from books a lot of the time, where you hear narration from the character, you hear their thoughts and their feelings about things? Well, you can have internal dialogue, I think. Yeah. That's a kind of a different issue, but yeah, I think you can have that, yeah. I feel like... Sorry, I'm trying to put this into words so someone else should talk while I think about how to phrase this better because I did not just now. I was like, yeah, I don't words think I understand the thing. The question. Yeah, let me think. Someone else speak for a minute. Well, I would just say that anytime you, you know, we just talked about it. We just mentioned words that in ways you can modify sentences and sometimes you're going to want to do it. Um, but we also just mentioned that a lot of times you probably shouldn't be doing it. So it's up to you. It's up to the way you want to write. It's up to how you want to write. It's also your voice. Uh, the reason we say and the reason why Elmore says it and the reason why Stephen King says it and other things like that about adverbs is for what we were just talking about. You want to show that person being defiant instead of saying they spoke defiantly. You want to show that person being sweet instead of saying that they spoke you know, sweetly to you. I would like to add a kind of a corollary to Go this whole it. thing about adverbs because we can use, uh, we can substitute adverbs for thinking or trying to make the story as, as spectacular as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Take any little word like very and get rid of it, for mm -hmm. example. It, you never need it because it does not convey any real information. Yeah. And then there are lots of other words which plague us individually. Christine yeah. Matthews, who has uh, is a writer and a uh, an editor and a good one, mm -hmm. has declared war on the word that. Yes. She hates it. 
and the not quite so much but she doesn't like that one either had been so. oh, any kind of linking <laughs> verbs mm -hmm. it's better of course if you can have an action verb and then you'll have your own very personal ones i swear that i do not know that i am writing the word just j-u-s-t <laughs> but of just. i do ah, it all the time yes. and then i have to go through and and you know with my uh, thank heavens for computers find the word and just take it out every time I put it in. I have a couple that uh, I always preach against. I actually published a blog about these just yesterday, I think. Oh, really? Yes, I did. Um, Where? On my <laughs> jenniferstolzer.com. Nice. Hey. Backslash writing, probably. But there should be a, a link to it. It's also my portfolio page, so you can see all my drawings. Ooh. But, um... Uh, I have certain tricks or whatever to help avoid these things. My three top... Hates are just, seems, and even. Ooh, good ones. Because just usually is fluffy. And if you can replace the word just with simply, you can remove it, generally. And simply and isn't I'm, much better. I'm sorry. I'm more no, no like simply it. is, you should get rid of simply. Yeah, yeah. she's yeah. saying if you can, it's, if, it's uh, definitely a scratcher. Oh, okay. It, my, That's how you an mean. example would be is like, uh, you can't just leave him here. It's like, you can't simply leave him here. Get rid of that. Because then you say, you can't leave him here. And that yeah, sounds yeah. way Big more name. assertive yep. and yeah. stronger in a sentence. Uh, I also, because I'm an audio person, an oral person, uh, whenever I run across the word just in when I'm reading, I out loud go, out loud I say, just. <laughs> so you're reading and you run into it and immediately my brain does that. And I'm like, that needs to go. Because I, it registers. If it sticks out, then it doesn't belong there. Uh, seams, I always seams. use, uh, I hate seams, hate it. because the question then is begged, if you don't know, how should I know? <laughs> exactly. It's like, it seems dark in here. Is it dark is or it is dark? it not dark? It's either dark the, or it's not dark. I you're the narrator. Agree. How am I supposed to know? If you uh -huh. can't tell, then I just, I'm going to question your intelligence at this point, because yeah. you, it seems dark. Is it dark or is it dim? I don't know. Tell it me. It either is or it isn't. Just think of Yoda. So yeah, I, I think everybody ought to make a list of demons and check them because yep. you'll find you'll find that you've got them. Everybody does. And have you thought of what you were going to talk about? Kevin? Oh, you got that hoop to doodle um, ready? Yeah, you got the hoop to doodle. <laughs> Two things now because I want to talk about seams real quick. <laughs> I think one of the problems with uh, being a the writer, the god of the story, mm -hmm. is putting player knowledge into characters that should not have it. <laughs> Game terms. Player, that's player knowledge, not character knowledge. Your characters wouldn't know certain things. So I do use seams when characters are in situations where they're not sure if this is what well, another character is The question you feeling. ask yourself when it says it seems dark, mm -hmm. you ask yourself is it or isn't it? When it says she seems upset, is she or isn't she? And if you can't answer the question, then seems belongs. Okay. But if you yes. can answer the question, then go ahead and answer it because you basically told us nothing. Okay. She seems upset. Is she or isn't she? I don't know how to respond to her now. Is she upset? Should we be upset with her or about her or yes. help her out or something? I don't know what to do now because you used the word seems and you didn't take a concrete opinion on this. Okay. It's like, I can tell if she's upset if you tell me she's upset and then we'll react accordingly. Um, observing other characters? Observe anything. Anything that seems something. <laughs> <laughs> That That's also the difference between that. the character and the narration. Yeah. So a character can seem, you know, a character can, you know, have something that seems something. Because that's the way the character is interpreting it. Mm -hmm. However, the narrator cannot. Because the narrator knows. Because yeah. the story either is or isn't. It yes. either is dark or it isn't dark. Mm -hmm. It either is cold or it isn't cold. It can seem cold, but only to the character. No, not the character the should be able to know if it's cold or not then anyway. Should. That's one of those things where you ask, is it or isn't Good it? Good point. You know, if it seems, uh, if like a character walks in and says, it seems vaguely evil in here. Yeah. Then yeah, he doesn't know if it's evil in there or not, but it seems evil. And that's where it seems is appropriate, because he doesn't know. Okay. Now, if he was evil, and mm -hmm. he walked in and said, this place is as evil as I like it, <laughs> and he said, it seems evil in here, then we're like, oh, no. Is it evil or is it not evil? You made it evil. <laughs> Are you happy now? You made it evil. <laughs> huh. um, now, well, we got a little off topic because, you know, we'll hear it. It about seems this. we've gotten off topic. <laughs> um, I was going to say that rule four seems like the writer's answer to following rule three. If you can't use anything but said, then how do you convey that the character said something? <laughs> like, that's great. With word choice? With and sarcasm dialogue? instead of with 
enthusiasm that was true. Could um, you show them being enthusiastic? And we, yeah, exactly. and we talked about that. It would be hilarious to see a writer who took that rule literally and just had said and then an adverb every single time. <laughs> Okay, uh, so... The anti-Elmore novel. <laughs> the anti-Elmore. The anti-Elmore rules. Uh, the next two are pretty straightforward, so I think in the interest of time, we should just skip over them. Uh, number seven. Well, not really. Well, you read them out. you got to read them Okay. That was not cool. We read them out earlier. It's okay. Uh, okay. Read them now. Five, 40 keep your, minutes ago. <laughs> keep your exclamation points under control. Uh, no more than two or three per 100,000 words of prose is what Elmore recommends. <laughs> and I disagree on that, but that's yeah, okay. It depends. I, I like an exclamation point every so often. But if you Are you Tom too Wolf? much... Are what? You Are you Tom Wolf? No. I'm well, then Tom you're not allowed. <laughs> but, yeah, Two or I three like per hundred thousand. Use everything in moderation. Sometimes I don't want to say that he screamed angrily. <laughs> Please don't, actually. <laughs> uh, the she said. Yes. Exclamation points lose their punch if you use them too much. Yes. That's what, how I learned it. It's like if everyone has an exclamation point on the end of every single sentence, yes. then they're all speaking at the same volume and no one's actually exclaiming. Sometimes that character just got to yell. Yeah. I think they're useful when, as long as they're not your go-to. I no. think that's what he means, actually, but the rule. Just use them when they're necessary, but don't use them so much yes. that they lose their punch. And perhaps he's engaging hyperbole to prove a point. But I might give you a couple more per every 100,000. Let's yeah. put it that way. Okay. <laughs> I think he's trying to be severe with people who probably have worse habits. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so number six, never use the word suddenly or all hell broke loose. Um, he said it doesn't require any explanation. Um, so I guess we won't explain it. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. No. Seven, regional dialect. Uh, it should be used sparingly, according to Elmore. Uh, once you start spelling words in dialogue phonetically and loading the page with apostrophes, you won't be able to stop. Mm-hmm. This is so true. I have an example of that. <laughs> this this one is from Tom Wolfe, whom he does reference, and he says that Wolfe could have a lot of exclamation points, which I think is probably sarcastical. Because I don't imagine he liked Tom Wolf's wording all that much. <laughs> Wolf can use exclamation points. <laughs> he said sarcastically. Wolf was a, a, a bigger than life character. He wore white suits and and went to the Bush White House and made speeches and stuff. So he was a, a big, big kind of guy. Anyway, uh, this he wrote is something that Tom Wolf wrote. The whole pod, brother. The whole pod. They would spark the big moke to sit down with one new fish you brought. Good job. I'm sorry? <laughs> Do you understand a single word of that? No. Like, okay. Are you intended to, though? No, but well, it does frame a good point. It's, that it's, to, it's what Tom Wolf wrote. Yeah. He really wrote it. Okay. But what Chili Palmer would say, or what Raj would say about Chili Palmer, that's why Chili Palmer was asking Nikki, did he know where Joe Lube was? What he was saying was, he knows. So you don't need an interpreter. And it sounds tough enough to me to be in the pen. Yeah. Huh? I still don't gonna... know what happened. Yeah, I was going to use an, that... an example that pretty much outlines similarly to what Fedora just said, but um, I was a huge fan of the Helsing manga series for a mm, while there. Yes. I loved Helsing. Uh, to emphasize that the priest was Irish, he was his <laughs> lines were written with an Irish dialect, and mm. I, for the life of me, still have no idea a single <laughs> thing he said. Because everything was done and and done I and I have it's, it's it was impossible for my inner ear to translate <laughs> what the crap he was actually saying. So I just trusted he was evil when he turned into a plant monster, and we oh. killed him. And I thought that was a success. I was gonna say now, he was one of the main bad guys. That's a problem. Yeah, <laughs> you can't so, tell what his problem. Well, and, been... and this goes to something because <laughs> Irish is one of those, and Scottish is another one, um, where actual phrasing can help you. Um, but you really probably shouldn't try and put it in every second. Uh, it's easier and much easier on the reader if you say what type of accent this person has as mm-hmm. opposed to trying to write in whatever accent. There's can, um, or oh, just sorry, use it ahead. sparingly now yeah. and then yeah. on a word or yes. two. Not use the vanity all the time. vanity accent. Yes. Where it's just like accent? you know, like one word every other sentence. A good example would be if you're writing a woman with a southern accent instead of dropping every single G yes, that she ever says. Exactly. Have her finish, you know, address someone as darling like yeah. once. And suddenly you have the, you know, it's there. We know <laughs> that uh, she's speaking with a southern accent because she said that one line and now it's in our heads for the rest of the time. 
Yes, but the point is, is to say something like, so I often write, uh, and I'm sure Fedora has as well, characters who are Irish or Scottish, and I will take phrasing, because the Irish especially have some beautiful phrases that they love to use, and you'll put those phrases in, rather than say, you know, some sort of crazy thing, or try and add in the dialogue and use, you know, laddie at the end of every other sentence, or something like that. Um, that you can use these beautiful, you know, Scottish phrases or something like that, and that is way more effective. Um, speaking of phrases, I was thinking about musical phrases and the the music, the rhythm of different characters' speech. I think that can also help a lot with accents. The end. Oh, and dun, specific dun. words. Specific yes. words like bairn, baby, kid, mm. Irish, Scottish. What? Use of that word instead of, you know, straight up baby or something that someone oh. from a different country would use yes. in place of certain American words. Yeah, that's... that's... Words. And that can add a lot of flavor to your novel. Mm-hmm. Just a little, just that little bit of vanity dialect. Exactly, is, is what works best. All right. Okay. Number We're eight. Good. Avoid de. Well, uh, let's eight and nine. Yeah, let's roll yeah. eight and nine together because they're Do both it. about the same thing. Avoid detailed descriptions of characters, places, and things. Uh, let's see. Is Everybody really... knows what a car looks like. Mm-hmm. So you just have to tell me how many doors it has. Well, some people, I. How does that interact with what I've always heard um, Natalie Goldberg say, she says in Writing Down the Bones in all her books, um, use details. You need to be specific. So use the right detail. The car, See, tell, me what, tell me what type of car it is. Maybe tell me the color or something cool like that. Tell me that it has leather seats or something. I don't know. But what I don't need, I don't need to know that it has a certain kind of trim. I don't need to know what rims it has. I really don't need to know what kind of stereo watt system it has. More importantly, I really don't need to know, like... All the, you know, I need to know what sees, what I interact with, what I touch, what I'm feeling, what, what I you, smell, what the that kind of notices. stuff. You know, yeah, exactly, what the character notices. Because anything beyond that is purpley prose that's going in there that, you know, as Elmore says, people are going to skip over. But if you have yeah. a character say those things, oh, yeah. then you know a lot about his character. Exactly. That he is a fight on, you know, auto nut. Yeah. Tell yeah, me that the guy loves classic cars or something like that. Yeah, if uh, if your point of view character, even in third person, is looking at a car and notices the rims, then we know automatically something about that character, not just about the car. Exactly. Because the character yeah. has noticed the rims, so therefore that's important to the character, so therefore he knows about cars. Or like the guy in a... really garishly unattractive rims that nobody can help not that nobody can help notice. Then we learned something about the car. Yeah, mm-hmm. And the same thing goes for characters. You know, I need to know the important stuff. I need to know their gender, maybe. Um, I need to know certain things about them. But do I need to know every little detail down to, you know, the scuff mark on their boot? Only if the scuff mark on their boot comes into play later. Sherlock's the only one who cares. <laughs> exactly. And we don't need a Sherlock Holmes description of everything. You know, as much as some of us see all that and take all that in, uh, the reality is to tell the story... You just need what you just need what you need to tell the story. As much dialogue or as much detail or as much description or as much whatever to tell the story. And anything else can get chopped away. I think you've just outlined rule 10 very well. Huh, yes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, try to leave out the part that readers tend to skip. We've been talking about that the whole time. Yeah, we kind of yeah. filled that one in. I guess that's why rule 10 is the most important one, he says. And why it can all be wrapped up in, uh, if it sounds like writing, rewrite it. Mm-hmm. It's like, if it's got any of those things, then it sounds like the author talking instead of the story talking. Just a couple of other quick things about the way that he writes. One is that he loves names, and his names are wonderful, like Chili Palmer, for example, is a great name, and he has lots of others, too. Uh, Ray Barbonia, who's called Ray Bones, and of course he's a... He's a scoundrel. So researching the names and having names that are perfect for the characters is a really big step up to you're not needing to describe them because there's so much right there in the name. And then the other part, of course, is the Sweet Thursday idea of I want to know a character by how he talks. Don't tell me I want to know by how he talks Mm -hmm. and what he does. And that's brilliant, because to be honest, that's what you're looking for. Exactly. You shouldn't have to use any of these descriptive words, any of these adverbs, any of that other kind of stuff. What you really should be able to do is have a character who can show us all that. 
Well, that's how we interact with humans in real life. Exactly. We're like We don't get a detailed backstory of every person we run into. We have to draw conclusions based on what our interactions are like with them. And the same goes for a reader reading about a character. She said informingly. <laughs> and Elmore, <laughs> Elmore Leonard also does a lot of research talking to beat cops, bail bondsmen to get research for his killers and so on, his bad guys. And he rewrites any and every sentence that sounds unnatural when he speaks it out loud. Mm -hmm. Some really great hints there. Um, since we need to wrap up now, I yep. just want to ask everybody what you thought of this little experiment going through someone's rules of writing. Uh, actually, one thing that's come out to me while we've been talking about it is that these are, he wrote down ten rules, and he said, mm -hmm. don't ever do this. This is like ten commandments. Mm -hmm. But uh, what we've been talking about through the course of things is there's exceptions to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's actually something uh, Leonard uh, mentions here himself. Because uh, he talks about Sweet Thursday, and it breaks a lot of the rules he was talking about. Uh, but he likes it anyway. <laughs> yep. When I was... Sweet Thursday came out in 1954 when I was just beginning to be published, and I've never forgotten that prologue. Did I read the Hoopty Doodle chapters? Every word. So even Leonard is like, you know, if you can break a rule if you know what you're doing. Exactly. Which, well, that's why the rules are there. Mm -hmm. But you have to know the rules before you can break them. And he right. mentions other people who do that, like exactly. Ray Lopez, for example, who or he Tom admires Wolf. anywhere. Tom Wolf. I'm not so sure he admires <laughs> Tom Wolf, but, but he does admire the others. Even. Atwood, I think. Margaret Atwood, he liked, too. They're like the, the pirate code, the pirate's code in Pirates of the Caribbean. Exactly. It's not, a, not rules, exactly. More like guidelines. Yeah, exactly. And that's a good sentiment to end it on, actually. <laughs> we'll end it there. Uh, so thank you guys for listening to this episode of Right Pack Radio. Uh, we are here every Sunday, so join us next week. Um, you will have your great David Lucas back, so uh, do check in for that. Other than that, have a great uh, time writing. He ended formally. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. The Right Pack would like to thank STL Books for allowing us to record in their bookstore. STL Books and Gifts is St. Louis's newest independent bookstore with an emphasis on fine literature for adults and children and the most comprehensive selection of St. Louis books available anywhere. Visit them online at stlbooks.com or in person at 100 West Jefferson Avenue, Kirkwood, Missouri, 63122. Tune in next week as the Right Pack will conquer yet another pondering issue in the writing industry.